so cool. So I think some of you went to the previous object list lesson we did last Friday. I just wanted to quickly explain sort of what we're doing from a meta sense as a, as a museum. And then we'll start with this short kind of digestible program. So uh, our current exhibit is called To Supply a Nation. Uh, it just went up in April. It's very cool. It takes a lot of household objects and just examines how things as simple as like a shawl or a quilt or a knife uh, or even like a tea kettle uh, showed that Americans collected goods and materials from all over the world as early as the colonial days. Uh, it's very fun, a lot of cool hands-on. If you've never built a bucket before, you can come to the museum and build your own bucket. Uh, and we were looking at some stuff and really just continually to be continuing to be fascinated by just how much objects can tell us about uh, American and, and human history. And so we wanted to make new programs for school, for children and for teenagers and college students and even adults, where we really focus on the object itself and how in combination with sources, a single object can tell us so much about our heritage and our history and our culture. So we have some things that are called object lessons. The one we did last week was about this medal that uh, was printed with the image of George Washington. It was actually a very interesting piece of satire about Washington and his relation to American Indians. It's really cool. It's a fascinating piece. And uh, we're going to continue to do these through the month to just try them out. But this week is going to be an art lesson. So we're going to look at a historic print that we have in the museum collection. Uh, right now, this is hanging in the Yoakum Gallery, which is in the basement of Memorial Continental Hall. And we're going to uh, just examine what it's showing and what that tells us about uh, America at the time. And I put the cart so far in front of the horse. By the way, my name is Kevin. I'm sure a lot of you recognize me some, from some previous virtual programs. Uh, I'm the curator of education here at the DAR Museum in Washington. And uh, the DAR Museum is uh, not quite a museum of the Daughters of the American Revolution or a museum of the American Revolution, but rather is a, a museum about the American home and the way that Americans have lived. Uh, from like 1690 to 1930, we cover a whole range of topics. And these new object lessons just give us a chance to examine them uh, in a different light. So I've got this historic print pulled up on the screen for you. And I just want to sort of get some initial impressions, look very closely at it, and try to think of the details that you're seeing. And if you can, put a couple of details in the chat. So anything that you might notice about who you're seeing in the picture, if you know their names, any unique objects or symbolism, anything like that. What are you seeing in this print? So Patty put in the Q&A, if you wanna click on the chat, Patty, and we can all see, but put in the Q&A that you're seeing Abraham and Mary Lincoln with their children, absolutely. How many of you have to know the names of the Lincoln children? Anything else you might notice? There's some stuff on the table, some stuff in the background. Some of their clothing is a little interesting. Obviously, Mary Lincoln's an address. Uh, something very interesting just recently uh, that uh, our current intern Monica shared with me during the Met Gala that Sarah Jessica Parker was wearing a dress inspired by Mary Lincoln's dressmaker, Elizabeth Keckley, uh, who was a sort of a Kind of a fashion designer in the 1860s. She was a woman of color. Abe's got the biggest chair by far. He's got this big armchair, sort of proportionately sized for him. Abraham Lincoln didn't fit a lot of chairs. You see the Capitol Dome in the background with the statue on top. I love you can see the little one. This the smallest Lincoln child is Thomas or Tad Lincoln is, is what we know him by. Tadpole Lincoln. Uh, he's right there trying to get mom's attention. Can you see what's in little Tad's hand? There's a little boy in the back reading a book. That's William Wallace Lincoln or Willie Lincoln. And yeah, all the all the men are wearing very similar suits. This, uh, well, the boys, Tad is not wearing a suit, but Willie and uh, the oldest Lincoln child, Robert, are wearing almost an identical suit. But their suits are not quite the same as Lincoln's, frankly, slightly out of fashion suit. But what's Willie wearing or uh, Tad, the smallest Lincoln? What kind of clothes does he have on?
Does it look like a dress to anyone else? It's a romper, bloomers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much. The interesting thing for, for Taz for me is his socks look like fishnet stockings. They're supposed to be, I guess maybe it's a pattern, but that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. At the time, and for a while after this, and a long time before this, this was the most common outfit for any child under a certain age, depending on the specific time and culture. But typically under like six years of age on average, most children would wear these uh, long little pants, um, these little pantaloons, and then they would all wear dresses or, you know, might maybe more like a long tunic. But this is a very practical piece of clothing. So the pants were normally a much cheaper material where the dress might be a little bit more expensive. Uh, as anyone who's changed a baby diaper will know, one of the hardest parts of that is buttoning the onesie back up. And so the way our ancestors solved that problem was if you were under a certain age, you wore a dress. And it was probably a dress that had a lot extra material that you could just let out as they got older. Just a really functional piece of clothing for a, a small child. Even the hair that Tad has, these little ringlets, very common for little boys to have uh, hair that we might associate more with little girls now, long ringlets uh, that would be parted to the side if it was parted at all. So it's kind of fun. Can anyone make out what piece of paper is on the table? Or, or if you can guess what piece of paper might be on the table. Yeah, you can see Robert and uh, Lincoln have watch change, symbolizing their sort of adulthood. Could be the Declaration. Julie, good guess. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually, is, this is a whole other side topic, but he was really responsible for sort of recentering the Declaration as an important piece of American political thought because we have no legal tie to it. Uh, but Lincoln said it was the, the golden apple. Latest newspaper edition. Emancipation, that piece of paper says on it, uh, emancipation, freedom. So that is supposed to be a little copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. Very good guess, Missy. But it could be any of those things. Also, it could have been like the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it might help us figure out what that piece of paper is if we kind of look at the, it's hard in this picture to see, but under where it says the Lincoln family, there's some text and that's the copyright information. I have that for you. Oh, this is something else I was thinking. Uh, this was a separate conversation, but uh, this image of Lincoln is pretty classic. He's, I mean, he's so recognizable. I would say that he's one of our very most recognizable presidents. Uh, but you can see him in a lot of different ways and different symbols pop up. The Emancipation Proclamation is in a lot of, a lot of depictions of Lincoln. This, uh, this classic statue we all know and love uh, has this interesting design on the, the throne that Lincoln's sitting on. You guys know what these are on the throne? I used to think they were books. Yeah, they look like pillars with something wrapped around it. You know, we have these very fashionable square toed shoes. So these, the, this shape here is actually um, the Roman fasces. You can see it on this statue as well. So this was a symbol of the Roman uh, Republic, sort of. It's a bunch of rods tied together which represents strength and unity. But the Roman version had an ax head or a blade that came out of the side of the fasces. And it was to represent sort of the, the function of the empire, the Republic, which was to both unify, but also protect and punish through the ax blade. Uh, but this symbol of unity, of course, is very much associated with Lincoln, very much the theme of the Lincoln Memorial as well. This statue here, also another statue in D.C., this is in Lincoln Park near the Congress building. Uh, this was paid for by the, the Freedmen's Bureau, heavily critiqued by Frederick Douglass for its depiction of this enslaved man here. But it also has this Fasci symbol. It's got a profile of George Washington. And in his hands, he's holding the Emancipation Proclamation. And this classic painting, people love their frontier Lincoln. Of the many things Washington and Lincoln have in common, it's pictures of them holding an ax. <laughs> it's one of them. And of course, this uh, very iconic depiction on Mount Rushmore as well. Lincoln's, Lincoln's always pictured with his beard uh, 
and it's weird sometimes when you see old photographs without a beard. To go a little bit more information about this print, it was made by Thomas Kelly in 1866 in New York City. So that raised an eyebrow for me because if it was made in 1866, I was wondering where this initial image came from. Uh, because these prints are normally created out of original paintings or drawings or, or newspaper images. So this was made in 1866, a full year uh, after the death of Abraham Lincoln. It's made in New York. I spent a lot of time talking about Lincoln history at President Lincoln's Cottage. And so when I saw this painting downstairs, I realized that there, or this print rather, that there are a lot of problems with it. Uh, it's patchwork together a lot of different eras of Washington and, and Lincoln history. So let's look at some examples of what's going on in this picture. So this is from the Brooklyn Even Evening Star. It was published in a newspaper on the 22nd of February, 1862. Amid the general joy excited by the successes of the Union cause, a black shadow has fallen upon the presidential mansion, and all who were personally acquainted with the family of the president shared in the deep grief occasioned by the death of little Willie Lincoln. He was a boy of such promise. So we're trying to maybe date when the author is trying to depict the Lincoln family. Well, it can't be after 1862. Willie Lincoln passed away probably from uh, possibly typhoid. Uh, the water quality in DC was absolutely horrendous. And uh, Willie Lincoln and Tad both got really sick. And Willie Lincoln actually, um, he passed away during a White House event and Mrs. Lincoln had to be called away to, to be told that her son was dead. And this was a, as you can, surely imagine. This was a very devastating blow to the Lincoln family. Uh, the Brooklyn Evening Star is a partisan paper. They're very pro-union. And they say this, a general joy excited by the successes of the union cause. This is 1862. Nobody's particularly doing well in the Civil War yet. Everyone's just kind of stuck in this nightmare together. And then to be stricken with the death of, a, oh, Willie was, I'm trying to remember, I think he was 12, maybe a little younger than that. Not very old. And uh, was very sick for a few weeks and then died in, in February. So, what this paint, what this print is depicting, is a print depicting a real scene. It has to be made uh, based on something before 1862. But then we look at a different source. This comes from the Philadelphia Inquirer in the 3rd of December, 1863, called "Completion of the Capitol Dome." At noon today, the head and cap of the Goddess of Liberty, now called the Statue of Freedom, were placed upon the apex, which completes the statue upon the dome of the Capitol. About 300 people were gathered in East Capitol Square to witness the crowning, and as the head rose to its position, a large flag was raised about 20 feet above the statue, and as it unfolded to the breeze, a battery of artillery from Camp Barry fired a salute of 35 guns, one for each state, and the crowd gave three cheers and quietly dispersed. The scaffolding around the statue will not be removed for two to three months, that much time being necessary to complete, I spelled it wrong in the article, the base on which the statue stands. So this is the statue on top of the Capitol building, the Statue of Freedom. It was also alternatively called the Statue of Liberty, but then it got really upstaged uh, by a different statue in New York. Very pretty. Uh, the silhouette of it when you're up by the Capitol is so cool. But this is what this, the Capitol actually would have looked like during much of Lincoln's administration. So again, this source is coming from December of 1863. So the scaffolding was up around the dome until 1864. Uh, but I'm not sure if a lot of Americans are familiar with what the Capitol building here on the right looked like prior to the end of the Civil War. It's a very small building divided in half, one side for the Senate, one side for the House. The dome was much, much smaller than it is today. It's a, a much less imposing building. The new building is so, so much bigger than this. And the dome itself is obviously just a, a huge, impressive piece of architecture. So for most of Lincoln's presidency, this dome would not have looked like that at all. There would have been no statue. A lot of times the dome was only half completed. One of the, uh, Lincoln's big early scandals was actually okaying the continuing of the building of the dome. Uh, people thought it might have been a waste of resources during the war, but Lincoln thought it was an important symbol to show that this war wasn't going to stop the American experiment, to kind of slow it down a little bit. So that's 1863. Willie dies in 1862. And if we further explore, we continue to find these sort of inconsistencies with this print. So this is a timeline of the Lincoln presidency. So 1862 in July, this is the first time that we have record of Lincoln discussing the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Uh, it's written down, I think, by, in Seward's diary, maybe Wells, uh, that Lincoln had discussed an idea of a uh, presidential proclamation to help end slavery. And then later that month, he has a draft of the preliminary emancipation proclamation that he shows to the whole cabinet. And uh, this is where Seward recommends waiting for a Union military victory, which is going to come later after the Battle of uh, Antietam. And then in September of that year, Lincoln finally issues the preliminary emancipation where he tells the South, this is what we're going to do in January. Uh, and this, this famous, all persons held as slaves in any state or designated part of a state, the people who are allowed shall be in, then in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And in January 1, 1863, uh, this is still celebrated in certain areas of D.C. as Watch Night. Lincoln signs the final Emancipation Proclamation, which immediately gives freedom to about, uh, oh, what's the number? 40,000 slave people in D.C. Uh, who are refugees from the South and some others throughout the country. And then uh, two years later, Abraham Lincoln is shot at Ford's Theater, and he dies on April 15th. So this print made in 1866 is a complete fiction. At no point was it possible to find in the same room Willie Lincoln, a completed Capitol Dome, and a, and a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. There's also other little things about this painting that are, that are fairly inaccurate. Um, Robert Lincoln didn't spend a lot of time in D.C. Uh, he also had a mustache for most of the time. He was at law school, and then he was in the Union Army. Uh, though he was in D.C. the night that his father was murdered. And then uh, Willie Lincoln, while he was young when he came to the city, Willie Lincoln did not wear a uh, dress by the time he came to D.C. He was wearing a suit, just like his brother, and was really frequently seen in a little child's military uniform that was uh, too cute, actually. I, I, could, uh, I had it up earlier. I've seen this picture so many times. This is Tad Lincoln, a little play cavalry outfit. Very, very cute. You know, a little pony that he rode around on. So this is kind of, I don't know, fan fiction commemorating the Lincoln family. So the question I have, and we've, we've looked through and we sort of picked this, this apart, what do you think the purpose was for making this print? Why would the artist have sat down and put this together? And on top of that, what's the artist's goal? Why is he depicting the Lincoln family in this way? That's an interesting thought, uh, Patricia, is that they're trying to show the first family without all the sadness and trying to create maybe this idealized version of them. I think something that I, I thankfully have no way to contend with or understand is just how traumatic it is to have a president murdered while in office. And again, very thankfully, I don't know what that's like. It has not happened in my lifetime. Uh, or even close. You know, the last time we came close was Reagan, but, uh, you know, famously the last president to die in office was John F. Kennedy, so brutally. And I think something I'm very used to hearing from that generation, I'm not sure if anyone in the chat was around when, when Kennedy was, was murdered, uh, but it, it seems like it shook the whole nation to its core. And I can't imagine how frightening that must have felt. Patty Parker says she was around, Barbara. Yeah, if you guys wanted to share a little bit of what it was like the day that Kennedy was murdered, what it was like. Um, my aunt, I just talked about it with not too long ago, and she was a child. And I think there was just a confusion about it because it just seems like so, it almost seems like nonsense. Yeah, you know, I was in, uh, I was in third grade when 9-11 happened. And that was, and that's how I felt then, which was just, it was just so confusing. Oh, Julie, you were in Okinawa, one of your, one of your parents was in the army, I'm assuming. Oh, you were in Dallas Bay. I can't imagine. Yeah. 
school was dismissed. Same. I was on a military base, uh, so we all we all got sent to our homes. But all all of our my you know my dad was on high alert. You know. Oh wow, that's Barbara. That's so great about your principal going to the classes individually. That's such a hard thing to do, and uh, uh, a really great thing to do for something so dramatic to really to really help everyone through it. You know, what's, what's interesting about Kennedy is also, you know, when Kennedy was shot, there had not been a presidential assassination uh, for a long time, or even a president dying in office. It's just, just FDR before that. Um, but Lincoln is the first president who is uh, murdered while in the office. There's an attempt before that on Andrew Jackson, but also the, the day that Lincoln is shot is, it's such an incredibly sad moment. Uh, I think it's April 11th. The war technically ended. Uh, was when when was Appomattox Courthouse? I think it was April 11th. It was right before that. It was just a few days before. And there was this feeling of like you know everyone knew there was a lot more work to do, and that by no means was the struggle over. But there was this general feeling of like just a weight being taken off Lincoln, especially. I mean that's why he was at the theater that night. Was it was like finally we can breathe. And at this moment where the nation's finally going to be able to start healing and getting through all the trauma of the past four years, the, the president's brutally murdered and dies uh, quite painfully and publicly. And I can't imagine how that would feel to be coming up on finally feeling hope again after so many years to have that snatched away from you. And so Lincoln's death is going to be as generationally important to those folks as, you know, Kennedy's murder, as, as 9-11 has been. But with the murder of someone being a traumatic event, there is an idealization, there's a fixation. And so Lincoln memorabilia in the 1860s is so widespread. Uh, it used to be that, you know, most homes had a portrait of George Washington in their house. And after Lincoln's murder, most homes have, a, have some sort of picture of the Lincoln family. So this is an attempt to create this, this moment of showing the Lincoln family happy together in a family setting, you know, with this moment of achievement on the horizon, the Emancipation Proclamation, and try to get people to, to see a quiet moment with the Lincoln family in their grief for them and in their remembrance. But unfortunately for the Lincolns, this scene uh, was not one that they would really have in DC because their whole time here was so traumatic and so painful. And the Civil War is an area of intense fascination and study in, in the Lincoln family as well. And I think with my time that I've spent with them, one of the biggest things that I associate with the Lincoln is that deep, deep experience of trauma that the family was just, you know, reminds me of Job. It's just the Lincoln families were just constantly under, under attack from just the universe. Their son dying. Mary Lincoln was in a terrible carriage accident while she was in the city. Lincoln's murder. And so this, this print is not necessarily a, a, a good source to learn about the Lincolns themselves or to learn about DC. It's actually really bad because it's a piece of fiction entirely. But it does reveal to us a little bit about how Americans were feeling about the Lincoln family, how they were carrying on the Lincoln memory after the war, and, uh, and generally how Americans sort of commemorated uh, the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. So we have this thing in the museum. I think it's really fascinating. I love talking about this with people. Uh, and it, for me, it shows just that primary sources sometimes, you know, they're not dictionaries. We're not going to this to look at a, at a definition that's going to be cut and dry for us, but it helps affect our thinking and our mood about how we feel about historical themes and historical moments. So uh, for all of its fiction, I actually really love this print. And I think it's a, I think it's a really good piece to have in the museum. The text under the heading, right under where it says Lincoln family, uh, that's the copyright information. So it's going to say that it was issued a copyright by the U.S. Copyright Office in 1866. And it's going to have the address of the copyright building. It's really hard to not, that, it's so faint, even on the print itself, it's hard to see. So it's tough for, uh, for photographs to pick it up as well. So that's our basic run through of the of the art lesson of the Lincoln family. We've got a couple of these made. One is about uh, more specifically about how children dressed and were sort of gendered in the 19th century. And then another one about this this uh, weird bird craft that we have. Um, 
But that's what we have. We're going to be doing uh, next week, we're going to be doing another object lesson where we're going to be looking at a very interesting ceramic container in the museum. Uh, and you could stare at this container all day and not figure out what it was for. But I think it's really fun piecing that puzzle together. Um, keep following the museum. We're going to be doing a bunch of stuff. I have time now if anyone has any other questions or just wanted to share some thoughts about looking at this print or about our, our object lesson series in general. Feels so strange not having the camera on. Does anyone have any other questions or anything like that? Uh, if you think of a question later, you had any comments, uh, you can always email them, museum at dar.org. Julia, is there just one more lecture? There's going to be uh, another object lesson in Friday. Those are what's planned. We'll be doing something virtually. We'll be doing a Tuesday talk and another virtual program in June, probably about a program that's being worked on right now regarding um, objects that were used by enslaved people, uh, a new one uh, that's going to look at some of our collections. But we still have to finalize that. So we'll we'll keep having virtual stuff, probably for for as long as I'm here. Thank you for all of your comments and your, your very nice uh, thank you. The, uh, the object lessons, there's six of them now that are on our website. So we'll probably dust these off every once in a while and talk about them because they're just, we have just so many cool things and you know we can't put them all on display with, with exhibit text all the time. So it's cool to pull them out for projects like this. So we're definitely gonna be doing more of these in the future. Um, and these are also all objects, or all these object lessons are being designed for classroom use as well. So when teachers come back to their classrooms in August, this is something that they can all, they can all use. These are all for free on our website, uh, dar.org slash museum. And yes, all of these are getting recorded and posted on YouTube. The previous object lesson about the Washington Medal, which I highly recommend, that's one of my favorite objects in the museum, that's on YouTube right now. This will go up on YouTube. And then the, the object lesson next uh, week will go on YouTube as well. And we hope to see you guys next week, next Friday, same time during lunchtime. If you want to put this on in the background while you're having lunch, uh, I love doing stuff like that. You feel free to join us. Um, we'll also be doing a Facebook Live here in a couple minutes when I close this out. Where we're going to show you guys some uh, something cool we had 3D printed, which is just a fascinating technology. And also sincerely, thank, thank you, everyone. It's, uh, you know, the virtual programs are very difficult when you're used to doing in-person things. And you guys are always so supportive of what the museum does. And it's always so fun to hear your thoughts and, uh, and to chat with you guys even through, through this medium. So thank you for showing up. And, uh, and I really look forward to talking to everyone again soon. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your weekend and take care.